Wrestling at the Chase is back August 27th and 28th as the NWA returns to the historic Chase Park Plaza Hotel in St. Louis, Missouri for NWA 74. Two nights of incredible action featuring title defenses from all the NWA champions. Plus, NWA wrestling legends will be in the Coruscant Ballroom for NWA's 74th anniversary extravaganza. Scheduled to appear, Baby Down, J.J. Dillon, Barry Windham, and on Monday, August 29th at Skyway Studios, a very special appearance by Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Tickets are moving fast, so get yours now at nwatix.com. That's nwatix.com. The NWA, wrestling as it's meant to be. It's time for the Wrestling Perspective podcast on Fight TV, YouTube, anywhere you get podcasts. That's where we are. You know, follow, tell friends, fuck, do whatever you do. I don't care. It's <laughs> Lars Fredrickson. What's going on, buddy? Oh, you know, I have been running around like a chicken with my head cut off, but I finally have slowed down enough to welcome one of my good friends, Mr. A. Steele, a.k.a. non-checkered past, yeah. a.k.a. no skeletons in the closet. You know, so he's here today. I'm pretty stoked because, um, you know, we've known each other for a while, and I think he's got a great mind. And he's got a great job, and I kind of want to like talk to him about his job too. So, a steal, ladies and gentlemen, yay! And he was just saying that this is his favorite podcast. He's listened to every episode. Ace, what Indeed. was your favorite episode? Uh, the one where <laughs> Lars wasn't on. That was <laughs> really awesome one. That's fucked up. See, that all, all the great. You know what, Ace? Here's the thing. There's a little way we run things around here, pal. Yeah, and it's like we pick on Dennis. We don't pick on the big oh, guy over here. I love oh. this. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> the dynamic Sorry. has switched. I, the yeah. power has moved. Oh my gosh, Ace, you're now my favorite guest. <laughs> well, awesome. Let's jump right into it. And uh, you know, when we started this podcast, we had PD Williams, who was a producer for Impact, now for WWE. And the yeah. beauty was we got to pick his brains. And the questions he would ask the guests came from like a totally different realm than the fandom Lars and I did. And we learned from PD in, in his question asking skills. So for you now transitioning from wrestler to producer, was there like a, a kind of a grim like, all right, my my bump punch card has been, you know, all punched out. I'm at the twilight of my career. Now I'm transitioning to this. Was it an easy transition mentally for you or was it a little bit harder? This happened to be easier because I made peace long ago. And sorry, you're going to have a Rupert stick his head in. Rupert, there's Rup. Sorry, but hey, Rup. down. <laughs> he's, he's not, uh, he loves attention. Um, no, I made peace with it long ago because I kind of, I had a developmental deal in 07. And when that ended, I kind of fell out of love with wrestling. And though I periodically would do stuff over the next few, few years, I had made peace with, you know what, like, uh, I wouldn't say the journey's ended, but I, I was happy with what I'd done in my career. I look back at the things I got to do, and I got to do a lot of things that people won't get to do and can't even do nowadays. Like, I wrestled people that don't exist anymore. I wrestled people from my childhood. I earned the respect from them. Um, I got to be known as, you know, a quality worker in the ring and respected that way. So coming back in as a producer, as a coach and a producer, um, it was a, it was something that I strive to get good at and still do, because I don't think you're ever great at something like this. Cause you're always learning. If you think you know it all about wrestling, you're a fucking fool. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd be so close-minded in today's market, especially where I work about how wrestling should be. I mean, there's a template I love to stick to, but as far as my personal feelings, no. Like, I love, uh, I'm not a religious person, but I believe that things happen for a reason and why that happens, I don't know. But I am so happy with my place in life. And I'm so happy. The last place I saw uh, Lars was the forum in LA. And I was so happy with the way that day turned out. And it just culminated, like, it was such a great night for my career. And I'm so happy about where I'm at in wrestling right now. Well, that's one of the things, though, Ace, is because you do have a lot of respect because of the roads that you've traveled. And you've also helped a lot of guys and guys that are like the big shots now in companies. And, you know, I feel like, you know, you're kind of like the unsung hero. You're like Lemmy. 
was to, to heavy metal music. Like Metallica, Judas Priest, the, and these bands will always get like cred, but and Motorhead will always be that, you know, hardcore fan base. That's the kind of way I see you. You're kind of like the Lemmy of that. So, you know, do you find it, you know, because you've garnered this respect, you've rubbed shoulders with guys like Harley Race, people like, the, you know, these greats, when we think of this business, do you feel like that uh, it's made your job easy as a producer because people understand where you come from? Uh, yes and no. Uh, the people I work with, as far as in the organizations, know that. The younger workers don't know that. Mm. So there's such a gap between, you know, my like it literally is someone would look me up on Google, would Google me and read my Wikipedia page. And then someone else would go, do you know who he is? You know, like you would think they would know. I was a wrestling nerd, wrestling dork. I know who trained who and who did this, who did that, yada, yada, yada. And I legit was training a guy at the PC, unnamed, and hot indie guy that came in. And it took a couple of days and he walked up to me and he goes, yo, somebody sent me a match with you and, Ab you and Ray Mysterio. He goes, I didn't realize that was you, coach. And I'm like, yeah, that was me. And he was like, holy shit you could go and i was like oh you know thank you um uh, it's it gets easier as that you know once i like building my reputation now and then people start to dig stuff up and they're like holy shit you know i'm like oh you know i i just wrestled the other night in uh, logan square auditorium for aaw uh wrestled an up-and-comer named matt fitchett who's you know coming along greatly and uh, I mainly did it because I wanted to help build his stock and give him some confidence and see if there's something that I can, you know, give him um, and pass on to him. And I think it worked and help him find something inside him. So uh, while my bumps are few and far between, like getting to do stuff like that, um, I appreciate the co compliment, by the way, being a, being a Lemmy of sorts. Um, yeah, you know, but that's the thing about people that help people. You don't necessarily, you don't want, if you're worth the shit, you don't want the pat on the back. It's nice to be acknowledged. Um, and I always strive for the unsolicited uh, feedback and compliment. I never ran up to someone and said, did I do okay? Will you just tell me I did good? If someone told me and gave me critique, I'd ask for critique, but I wouldn't ask, you know, how good was I? If that, you know, if that makes sense. Being a producer, you, you help craft matches. And where did your... I wouldn't say background, but your fundamentals on how you want to craft a match. Cause I, I, I don't think, I think producers are like snowflakes. No two producer has the same uh, visions as other producers. So how did you kind of create your background, your visions of how you want matches to go or your suggestions? Sure. Um, I think it starts with the story always. It's not just, you know, that's what wrestling is all together. What is your story? What story are you telling in this match? Is it the story of I'm going to deck you with a punch? Is it the story I keep pulling the hair and finally, you know, the baby face turns it around on me? I don't know. Whatever the story is, it's got to be a story that leads the crowd through. It could be a story of moves. I keep trying to go for a certain move and get a single leg, but you can't. It, it doesn't matter what it is, but I got to have a story. So I work backwards. I got to find out where we're going, where the destination is, and then work backwards from there and then, you know, put the rest of the match together, so to speak. And uh, you'll have someone come in. I've had that a lot. And this is the best part, too, where they the light bulb goes on for the talent. And they're like, man, I really want to do this today. And then when we find out the direction of the match or how we're going to craft it, uh, that they're smart enough to look at me and go, that doesn't fit today. I'll try it next week or I'll get it in somewhere else just to do things, to do things like that's part of the things I like to impart to people. Like just cause you want to do this today, it just doesn't fit today's match or story or whatever we're trying to tell. But ultimately to me, each match has to be a story, no matter what it is, the story of annihilation. Well, today you're going to go in there and get your ass kicked. Thank you for making so-and-so look good. That's how today works. You're not going to get anything. So, you know, it's, it's interesting that you're, you know, we talk, we're talking about the story because that's kind of what, professional wrestling in my opinion is in a nutshell right it's like getting into the ring and yes it's physical and yes it's it's it, but the psych psychology has to be there that story is being told how do you find it hard because you know in today's modern era of wrestling there's a lot of spots it's more about popping the crowd it's not really about hooking the crowd you know i feel some sure but that's that's sure. okay there's a place yeah. in wrestling for that they're just like there was a place for Gigi allen 
in punk rock and crass, you know, two totally yeah. different ends of the spectrum, you know, do they owe us a living and then shitting in my hand and throw it at the audience. It's like two <laughs> totally different things, but uh -huh. it, it belongs under that roof. Do you ever, do you ever, is it ever hard for you to explain the whole psychology aspect, the whole st storytelling aspect to some of the newer guys because the way that they've come up? I mean, do you feel like you kind of have to almost get with their program or do you kind of feel like you got to kind of maybe bring them down to kind of where you're at? I mean, how, how do you approach it? It's a healthy mix. It's always been a healthy mix for me, especially in this environment. So let's say I've been really back in the mix in the last um, four years, four or five years or so. Like I started wrestling again out of necessity for me to like, like it was my wellness thing. I like, I needed something to hold on to and get back to and wrestling was my thing. So I got back in shape and that's when I got back in with guys like a Matt Fitchett five years ago, four or five years ago, who's 20, let's just say he's half my age. I'm going to be 49. I am 49. I'm going to be 50 next year. Okay. So I've got to have still young. Eh. I still have to have the blend of what's going to make these people, you know, go ooh and ah, but then help these guys along. And they understand how to, to tell a story. So I'm lucky in the fact that these guys came along a little earlier, so they understand where I'm going and will listen to me. Now, when I produce a match, um, I walk in with that mentality of, I know where some of these people are. So I just ask them if they would tweak certain things in the match to help it out, so to speak. You know, like, yeah, you're going to hit Dante Martin, can hit this flip. That's phenomenal. But why do we hit that and where do we hit that? um helping out with those intricacies and every match is different every match you know the, the blueprint is different every day every fucking hour every you know second that we do something it's different everywhere i don't think anyone some people walk in with the formula and it works great for them um uh, the basic formula again is story they'll ask me what would you like to see um uh, i'd like to see some type, some type of story if you have a story to go into a match something a body part what can you, you know, a lot of times it's a time factor. What do you do in five minutes? What can you do with five minutes? You can do a lot in five minutes. I can show you a match with uh, Macho Man Randy Savage and Jumpin' Jim Brunzel, where Savage was the Macho King and he had Sherry with him. And Jumpin' Jim was not the killer bee anymore. He was just, <laughs> he was just in for the weekend. And out of, in five minutes, and I'm going to send this to you, you're going to, you're going to look at it and go, holy shit. In five minutes, they did so much shit. But when you look at it, they really didn't. But they gave me such a match in five minutes. It got me everything I needed. I knew Jim Brunzel was, a, was on par with Macho Man. Macho Man was a heel and a half. Sherry was involved. And Savage looked like a star. Everybody shined in this thing. So, um, again, like I ramble on a little bit. But finding the perfect mesh with everybody, it, I mean, it's just I, I think I'm adaptable. Because I, I used to be that guy. I'll put a match in that myself and uh, Punk have had, and it's awful. And I'm like, what are we doing? Like, why do we keep going? Like, this should have ended five minutes ago. And it keeps going. And I, But we don't know. We didn't know then. Because no, there really was no one to sit there, sit there and go, no, 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 you did too much. You know, until like a Harley race came along in our lives, things like that. And you're also in there with, a, you know, a CM Punk. Like, you know, he's not going to yeah. bring anything to the table. Anyways, yeah. I digress. He wore shorts. Don't, I mean, don't come on. sue me. Don't yeah. sue me. Go ahead. This is actually the perfect lead in for my next question because I feel like you're that last generation of wrestlers where it took 10 to 15 years to get to that upper echelon of wrestling where you have the respect of Ring of Honor, WWE, a TNA, or an impact. And the kids, look, I'm 40 something years old. The kids today, they make it up there in six, nine months sometimes. And they, they're not polished. They don't know the intricacies. They work too fast and all this stuff. But do you guys realize how important the job is as a producer now to have to bring that knowledge to them in a crash course kind of way? I, I think so. The ones that, I mean, and I, I speak for all of us that anyone that's got any experience from you know, who's been around a while, like a, like a Jerry Lynn, like shit. I would look at Jerry. Well, I would love, I've only had two matches in my life with Jerry Lynn, but been around him a lot and to feed off of him when he was still working, like to see someone like him talk to talent, you know, like he's another one. I think that although people will go back, like even the workers would go back and maybe um, see my wife was a wrestler. 
and she had never seen ECW. It's a different time for her. She didn't. And I put in Jerry Lynn and Rob Van Dam the other day. I said, watch this and see what, like, she just wasn't an ECW. She didn't get it where she was, you know, it just wasn't, it just wasn't something she followed. And she was like, holy shit. I'm like, little different flavor for you. And I'm like, we used to strive to be like this. Um, we do, we understand our job. It gets frustrating. It gets frustrating because you still have people that know it all. It's just, it's, but that's been wrestling forever though. Yeah. So the light bulb goes off till they know I have a system and this is what Harley put in place. Um, it was, this is what he instilled in me is that he would give me chances to fail. He wouldn't set me up to fail, but he would give me the chance to succeed or fail. And if I did fail, I'd go back and sit down and you'd say, I wanted to let you see for yourself. I do that. I do that. I hear some of the goofiest God awful spots sometimes or sequences. And I'll say, yep, let's do it. I might think in my head, that's not good, but I want to build my rapport and trust with this person. So they'll look at me and go, I kind of had this idea, but I don't think, uh, or I'll shake my head and go, don't do that. Okay. Yes, coach. Well, you know, like you, you mentioned Jerry Lynn, which, you know, I got a chance to meet him for the first time in Vegas. And I've known you for quite some time. We spent some considerable amount of time with each other. And what I've come to find about you and guys like him and, and you and Jerry Lynn, you guys are kind of like these, the, the older stalwarts. There's, there is a generation younger than you, but it seems like that generation younger than you is, oh, is it, you're their learning curve. Is, would, was that a fair assessment? Sure. Certainly. Certainly. Okay. So in what, have you ever played a part in somebody's like, you know, dusting off the ring rust or, or getting somebody back into shape? You know, why are you that trusted guy that people, a lot of people go to for those types of things? I mean, I like maybe, this is a, maybe, maybe this is a little known fact to our listeners, but like, you know, Ace is one of those guys where people may be coming back or whatever it is, or, you know, want to up their game, he's the guy to call. So I don't really know how to phrase that question other than I did, but I just kind of wanted to. Um, it's, you know, it's a bit of tooting your own horn at this point, but I well, think I've I, I'm a- trying to, t- I'm trying to toot it, toot it for you, bro. That's, yeah, that's fucking let him do it. Yeah. Do all it. right. All right. All right. So I just think I've built that trust and rapport with people because I'm an honest guy. I'm not a dick. I've, uh, you could, I, I'm a terrible liar. If I said something looked like shit, or if I said, oh, that looks great. Like you could tell in my face that I'm saying that looks like shit with my eyes. Um, I've always been a solid competitor. Always. Like I was talking about this the other day. Like I've never wrestled Brian Danielson, but that's only because I didn't ask to, it just never got booked back where I came from. We didn't ask to exactly work people. We just took the bookings and move on. Nowadays I'm not working every time Dick and Harry, I'll say I want to work Ricky Morton and that's the card. Otherwise I'm not coming, you know, stuff like that, not to be arrogant, but uh, so a guy like Steve Carino has a match with his son and Steve and I were working at, at the PC together at the time. And he was, he just wanted to run stuff by me and just roll around a little and get some ideas. And, you know, we feed off each other. Um, I might be out in him here, but now that we work at the same place, I don't think it matters. Like, CM Punk before his comeback rolled in the ring with me he didn't trust anyone else he wanted to see how he felt he wanted to see how things would go we ran spots we worked for a couple days in a row um I I think I've just built that trust as an honest and solid person um just as a person myself and then my ring work I think I've always been thought of as very solid and very capable and you know uh, that's the best I can say I mean uh, I, I've gotten put over a lot by a lot of people. The respect that I get is, is very heartwarming of uh, the respect. I, the respect I still get. Um, I work with a group of people in a ring on Mondays and Fridays. Sometime uh, I won't name them by names, um, but they are people that work for our company and it makes me feel good that they want to come train with me just to get some reps in, just to learn, just to let me coach. Like, you know, they can, Think, think about it when you get in, uh, you know, if I were to go in and, and listen to someone and I'm not saying I'm exactly their elder statesman, but somebody that, 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 you know, can, it's just like a trainer at a gym. I know how to work out. I know how to lift weights, but I would like to go have a trainer run me through it. So that way 
not that it's so much mindless, but so I'll get pushed. I'll get pushed to that next level. And I, I don't know. I think I've just built up a decent reputation with that um, going, you know, throughout the years. You were one of those casualties of COVID. It seemed like mm-hmm. you, you got, you were hired to do your dream job as a coach in NXT mm-hmm. and COVID hit, they furlough you, then they kind of bring you back. And then ultimately you were gone. How much does that experience weigh on your shoulders? Cause I know PD, he, uh, I don't know if he minds me saying this, but he sometimes he produces from like, I don't know if I'm going to lose my job today or tomorrow. So I've got to bring my a plus game every single week. Now you get this, this, I don't want to say a second chance because you're accomplished. You would have landed somewhere, but you, you go from one a to one B, which a W is not the one B. If you understand what I'm trying to say. Sure. And here you are now. Do you do you have that little bit of this happened once? It could happen again. So you've I'm sure you've heard this enough or, you know, it's pins and needles over there. It always has been. It always has been. I don't know why the fuck it's that way. It doesn't need to be. Everybody puts pressure on everybody there. It's horrible. It's a horrible feeling. I learned TV producing and how to do how to call it to the truck and yada, 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 because guys like Adam Pierce said, you need to learn that you need to have those tools in your toolbox. William Regal said the same thing to me. I fought to do that. They wanted me to just be a coach. I think the fact they wanted me to be a coach more than anything was because they needed the in ring, but also they'd seen so many people plucked away to be producers. I mean, Adam Pierce was hardly in the PC two years taken to the main roster. People shotgun through. Now, obviously, some are greenlit faster than others for such a job, but I fought to do that for my own well-being, and I'm glad I did because I walked from there right into another job where I was certainly capable of doing it and had the knowledge of that place. Um, AEW is not that way. Now, I had a lot of friends in Kansas City that were extras there, and I hardly got to talk to them. I said hello, gave them a hug, ate a little catering with them, but I had to freaking go because I'm busy. I have a busy day. It's stressful because you want the show to come off great. It's not stressful mm-hmm. because you're being judged. I don't feel like I'm being judged. You always feel like you were being judged over at the other place. And if anybody wants to dispute that, they can kiss my ass. Everybody always felt judged. Up and down the line, I don't care who you are, you always felt like you were being judged walking in there. And that's a shitty way to do business. Just is. Well, you know, I mean, I, I know Dennis has got more questions about your time up there, but I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about training. Um, and one of the things that I've, I, I've sort of always been curious about, have you ever gotten, I mean, how, how much time does it take for you to, when you get into the ring with somebody for the first time to realize if they're the shits or if there's something there? I'll be the first few minutes. You, I mean, definitely in a day, you can say in one day or a couple hours of training, you realize, uh, I mean, what I would do, and I helped tons with the tryouts over at, uh, at NXT when we would do tryouts. So you can evaluate pretty quick. And then you would see them get entered in the system. You're not always going to hit a home run with your predictions. But um, it, you can, it, the evaluation period is, is fairly quick if you know what you're looking at. If they well, are an est- if they're an established competitor, you're going to know right away from them getting in the ring and working a match. You can see that there's something there or not. Then you can go to the next step and see if they'll listen. And if they don't listen, well, then that's their own death. Because if they don't have, you know, mouth shut, ears open, you know, you go play somewhere else because, you know, this isn't for me. And that's for anyone that teaches in this business. If that's what you have, you give up because you're like, they're not listening. I, I don't even want to bother with this. Well, I mean, I, this was kind of a two-part question. Pardon me, Dennis. But has there any ever been anybody that you've got in the ring where maybe after a day or so, you were pleasantly surprised that like, oh, I originally thought it was this way and it went this way. Or I thought it was this way and it went this way. <sighs> I definitely you can see just things don't work in someone's head sometimes um it is frustrating when i spend time with someone um it used to be this way when we had the steel domain 
that I would show somebody something and I'm a wrestling nerd and dork. You show me something, I'm forever going to remember that, study it and move on and always have that. Now, what I wish I did was take notes. There is a key to today's competitors. And it's just, it's just like anything, in my opinion, you're studying. Um, a guy like Grayson Waller, who works for NXT, had a notebook and was taking notes right away. People I work with now, uh, AQA has a notebook. Um, uh, I've seen MJF with a notebook. Like, there's an idea. Um, and I don't think I'm outing him by saying that. Roddy Piper had a fucking notebook. I watched Roddy Piper have a notebook of things to say. Um, you find a quote, you're like, that's going to work somewhere. I'm going to put it down. You can have it categorized. Steve Carino has a notebook. He's got a manual on so many things. Steve Carino has been, I mean, he's, he's a gaijin legend to me for Japanese wrestling going over there. And he still, he's a perfect example of someone that still learns and still will, you know, look at the business and, and not look at you and say, I know everything. Let me write a book and tell you how great I am. No, he still learns and he's much more successful than a lot of people I know. And he's so modest about it. Um, I've had pleasant surprises on the front of larger people more than smaller workers. Um, smaller people can get bumped around and take things. It's the large, a lot of times the, the giants are a lot, lot harder to finagle and get them to really understand things. I mean, I think a lot of times it comes down I'm not saying I'm a fighter by any means. And I say this every time I get in the ring, I say, I'm all pro wrestling. There's no shoot bone in my body. Like I wasn't taught to take someone down like Lou Fez and hook them. You know what I mean? Harley showed me a couple of moves to help protect myself, but you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be talk about the bone breaker that he could have been or the slugger that he was. Um, but you see guys that haven't ever been punched in the face before. And you can tell, <laughs> simply you can tell when they take a punch or give a punch that they've never you know and on this on the flip side of that there are guys that will tell you i've never been in a fight ever i'm like well shit you strike pretty awesome well it's because they trained in it and you know that discipline um it's a hard thing sometimes for mma people to transition over and i always say this because uh the selling factor you're taught not to put too much emotion right. in what you do you get caught in a rear naked choke uh, you're watching something in a cage and they just, they're just looking for the out and they're thinking and calculating instead of a pro wrestling call the sleeper. And you're like, Oh geez, oh, I'm going, 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 you know, <laughs> but the fucking people got to see that you're going, going, going. I don't care if Marina Shakir puts me in the chokehold motherfucker, get me out. Cause I know I'm going. Well, that's so. interesting. Cause we talk a lot about when we interview people, pro wrestling and sports entertainment, and it seems like now more than ever, there's just this divide right down the middle. You're either sports entertainment or you're pro wrestling, but what's the happy medium? That gets into so much. I mean, we got time. This is a <laughs> nine hour podcast. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> Another thing oh. Lars didn't tell me about. Yeah. Well, I'll hope you pack the fucking <laughs> lunch. Yeah. Well, that's, that's part of the suit. <laughs> <laughs> um, Man, sports entertainment is so, from the day Vince came down and said, I want to see stories told, and I don't care if the guys are this or that, you know, I want to see, I don't care about the top rope moves, I don't care about this, I don't, I, sports entertainment is not mat wrestling, it's not, it can be, it certainly can be, I think anything that's entertaining, I mean, he just doesn't like the word wrestling because, I mean, it's so dirty. I, I saw a quote from Tony Storm, that, and it was true. We got a text. Don't talk about wrestling. Don't use the word wrestling. What the fuck am I teaching today? <laughs> a drop-down hip toss is, you know, you know, tackle drop-down hip toss. That's that's sports entertainment. It's, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's such a silly thing to me. Um, it's certainly a point of contention. Uh, I think the crowd needs to be entertained no matter what, no matter what is going on in the ring. I teach people how to work camera angles. I don't just teach them on the mat wrestling. I'll turn around and look over there and go, there's your hard cam. I said, I love what you're doing on the mat, but point it there because we're a television business. We are. It's all a television business. It's exactly where I work right now. 
yeah, we have people with floor cams, but I need you to look right in that fucking camera and show me that you're cranking that hole. I need to see the pain in that person's face. Don't close your eyes. Look up. Get out of the fucking hole. Like, it goes back to the story, the story you're telling. You could tell a sports entertainment story. You could tell a wrestling story. Um, it, like I said, there's just, it, it's just kind of silly to divide them completely. And, and you're like, but our business is wrestling. If I don't have any substance in it, well, what you end up with is uh, people getting their faces slammed in cakes or some stupid gaga where someone comes out and shoots guns off, you know, like, I don't know what the fuck they're, they're doing during matches on, you know, a Friday night or Monday night show. And that's their business. That, you know, they obviously draw a lot of great ratings that way. Our company is more wrestling based, whether it be high flying, whether it be uh, Daniel Bryan on the mat or CM Punk and Hangman Page, you know, knocking each other around, like putting in some snug, stiff stuff. We are certainly the alternative to that, to showing you how this business, in my opinion, should be. That that place, it's the, you know, it's like when you go watch movies, what kind of movies do you want to watch? Horror movies aren't just, there's a completely different, horror movies are so different, and I'm not a connoisseur of horror movies, but if you ever seen the movie Terrifier, that's a lot different than, uh, you know, uh, Friday the 13th in a little bit. There's a lot a lot the same in there but terrifier was that was pretty out there um by that same token go to a horror movie could, could be considered a spooky movie or i i don't know you know it could be some killing but nothing too because psycho they call psycho a horror movie don't they or is that more of a thriller i don't know i mean if you haven't seen terrifier don't let the kids watch it but holy shit you know um you know, someone, I, I won't ruin it if you haven't seen it, but you're in for a rude awakening. Um, Do you have stock in this movie? Because you're mentioning it an awful lot on this <laughs> podcast. You, 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 ought to, you guys ought to get together and Zoom zoom it and watch it together. Do a, do a watch party, if you will. We watched it together, Ace. Uh, oh. <laughs> like, I mean, too many shots to the head, bro. Hey. Hey, you didn't tell me the podcast was fucking happening tonight. You said yesterday is okay, tomorrow good? I said, yeah, and I never got a text back. I'm sorry, man. I, I've got kids. I, I understand. I got no, tacos but, that are on the other side of the screen that will be eaten promptly I'm, after. Well, you know what? I looked like Dennis had a second part to his question. Dennis, did you want to ask that? Uh, Please, well, I, if I answered your question. Yeah. You, you did there. absolutely answer it. But then uh, going into being a producer – is is there also a fine line you have to walk between sports entertainment and wrestling knowing now that there's some sort of weird feud brewing between you know x y and z and a b and c because some guys are sports entertainers other guys are wrestlers uh one's a really dirty word that came from up north and the other one is <laughs> you know um it all depends on who's in the match I mean, there's plenty of room for a little gaga, you know, if you're the right guy. If you're Danhausen, there's going to be some gaga. Now, Danhausen wants to wrestle. He's a wrestler at heart. But I don't really want to see Danhausen wrestle. He painted him over the corner. Yeah, I mean, and he wants to wrestle. And I get respect and love that. You have to, because that's what he originally got into this to do. He didn't get into this to be, you know, well, you know, it's it's a – the blessing in disguise, what he became, you know, like, holy shit, you know, like came up with his character. Here we go. I, I didn't have to see him wrestle once. And I was fascinated by this dude. Yeah. Um, when you have him in a match, you know, we're not looking for the coolest arm drag or anything that's going to come out of it. This is the story part that I need out of this guy. How are we telling this story today? You know, what's going to happen here? Um, you have, let me think of someone else. Let's say I got Kyle O'Reilly or Bobby Fish in, in a match. I got Kyle O'Reilly and Samoa Joe. Well, here's two pros. What are you guys going to tell today? I don't know. Joe's arm is beat up. Okay, so you're going to go beat up his arm today. Um, is there anything you'd like to see? Maybe like to see this. Okay. I mean, once again, I'm talking to two peers as opposed right. to young, young guys that are like, I need help. Um, it, it all depends on who is in there and what, you know, what is happening that night? Is it the end of a tournament, the culmination of the Owen Hart Invitational? Or is it 
random match for five minutes that I have to, this guy has to look better than the other guy that all factors in. Do they have a storyline going like, and I know where you're going with this, but Chris Jericho's got the, you know, the feud with Kingston and, and those gentlemen with, you know, sports entertainment versus pro wrestling and Eddie Kingston's pro wrestling is very Japanese strike based. We all know this. He's such a mark for Kobashi and Masawa that his matches are that spinning back fist and forearms. We're not talking pro wrestling as in arm drags, you know, keeping the arm and working an arm over. Um, it's, it's completely different. Whereas Jericho is probably going to try to find something in there where he can gloat or get a camera shot. Honestly, you can gloat and get a camera shot in a pro wrestling match because you can still drill the crowd in. You're still, I, I think all in all, you're still looking to draw the crowd in. No matter who the hell you are, or if you want to call it sports entertainment or wrestling, if the crowd's not there, what the fuck are we doing? Well, you know, I, I think we've talked a lot about, you know, your time up north. But one of the things that I think that would be interesting to hear about is maybe what is the one thing or maybe there's a few things that you actually learned up there that maybe you're applying now currently, if, oh, if there's, any. Oh, there's tons of things I learned. I'm thankful for the training ground. I'm always thankful for everything in my journey. Everything, even even when I was in OVW in 2007, I learned plenty. Was I enjoying my time? No. You're silly if you don't take away anything out of any uh, out of anything that you do. Everything, and, and it's gotten me to this point. So there's there's plenty of things I take. Um, structures of matches, different things in matches, um, heels and baby faces, how they operate in a match. You know, it's not just pretty move, pretty move, pretty move. Um, again, there are some people that think wrestling should be a certain way. I think the greatest thing about our company is that it's, it's a buffet of things. Um, I always strive for it to look as solid as possible and as legitimate as possible. For instance, today I ran a, I, I ran a sequence of person locked up, snatched the headlock and was working the headlock over. And when they got shot off the ropes, the drop down happened in such a way that it's the element of surprise instead of, I'm going to drop down and you run over me. Right. You see that every day. You can still suspend disbelief in what we do. And I guess this is obviously the type of podcast where we pull back the curtain um, the cat's out of the bag, right? You know, there's a lot not, of magic. Not here. Well, what no, here. Yeah. What's yes. he trying to tell us, yeah. Lars? I don't know. I think I'm he's scared. To blow it. I think he's. Yeah. I think he's sports entertaining us. That's right. Watch this gig. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's ketchup. Um, <laughs> chicken blood. I. Chicken blood. Oh. <laughs> there's, there's your GG Allen. Chicken yeah. blood and shit. Yeah. Um, like mom used to make. <laughs> sorry whatever <laughs> you know <laughs> oh, oh shit uh, uh, i've always i've always strived to make my pro wrestling my in-ring work and everyone else that i work with i always strive to get them to make it as believable as possible something's gotta it's timing's gotta look quick a nice pretty spot in an arm drag can look really great if it's done with the proper timing um, and proper timing, meaning the mechanics of it. You can do anything you want and be sloppy and be faster. Cleanliness equals speed. That's what I always strive at my training. Cleanliness equals speed. So the fact that when the person drops down, as the person comes off the ropes, if they're waiting in the middle of the ring and this person's already just like a, a tackle spot, somebody gets shot off the ropes and they're standing in the mid ring for the tackle and they get knocked down. How silly does that person look if they didn't advance towards them to get waffled and flat? It just makes the difference in what the crowd's going to experience that night. And there's no denying how we feel after this. I'm still feeling like shit. Um, but Saturday I had the match I had. Now, granted, it was a street fight, but there was no blood. It was just a lot of solid work in a ring, around the ring, brawling. There was some furniture, if you will involved but even so if i hadn't had that i'd still be sore my neck would be sore like i should be more demolished than i am for using weapons but uh i just strive for the realism and the things i take from there were just to always tighten up our work um always keep everything tight your stories were paramount that's paramount in sports entertainment that's paramount in wrestling so 
to make a, such a division out of it, uh, sports entertainment's Brutus Beefcake. Da, 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 you know, let me put the sleeper on. High knee. Oh, he's stuck on the mat. He's on, oh, Daddy. Oh, I can't get out of this. You know, <laughs> that's that's bullshit sports entertainment. The road warriors coming to the ring and knocking someone's head off. That's a different way of entertaining. But watch, you know, the earlier version of the road warriors versus the WWF version, you know, of the Legion of Doom. Uh, completely different. Yeah. And, it, and I'm talking about the time where they learned how to wrestle and not kill people versus their WWF days where they certainly knew how not to kill people. Still did some good stuff, but it wasn't the same. They didn't have the same ambiance or aura when they came to the ring when Iron Man would hit. You want to watch a pop, watch any All Japan match with the Road Warriors in it and hear Iron Man hit from back in like 1986, 85, 86. Holy freaking shit. Like that gets you the hair on the back of your neck. You know, that's a rock concert. That's a rock yeah. concert. I, I feel AEW is like a rock concert. People are singing, people are jamming. They're loving the wrestling. It's hard hitting. Um, that to me is what I want to see in my wrestling. I watched that from afar when I was up North and I'm like, okay, some things might not be the cleanest ever sometimes because everybody's learning. Because over here at this place, we've got a microscope and a gun to your head to make everything fucking this, this, this. But on this other side of the platform, man, people are coming to see this because this is fun and they're having fun. And I think having fun, I always want to have fun. If we're not having fun doing this, it becomes like any other job. Much better than digging ditches. And no, you know, no, but you want to have fun with what you're doing. And that place taught me to try and have fun with everything, even if I was having a miserable day, you know. Lars, I'm going to propose that we ditch the game this week because I am, I've got so many questions I still want to ask this guy. I'm and, fine. Okay, good. Because normally we play. Because I know, I know he's watching Terrifier, you know what I mean? Of course, he, oh. he owns it. He owns, he, <laughs> he's obviously a producer, some yeah. sort of, I mean, produced the film maybe. Number two, I'm coming yeah. out with number two. <laughs> You know, as you speak, I, I've been crafting this question in my head, and I don't even know if it's a legit question. So feel free to tell me it's the dumbest question you might have ever been asked. But that company up north has touched almost every wrestler in some sort of way, whether you've worked there, whether you've watched the product, you've, you know, we've been brainwashed by the WWE to believe that wrestling, even though it's evolved over time, is, is a certain way. Now you create a company of, you know, and you do your own thing, but how hard is it to, I don't want to say keep that influence out, but not fall back on it. If something doesn't work in AEW, if that makes sense. I see. I, I kind of see where you're going here. Um, I will say this is how I've been groomed or this is what I think in a match, but I don't have to think that way now. I'm not binded by, you know, those parameters. I can do whatever the fuck I want. Now, in my opinion, this is just fine. Or if we make it this way, you know, um, I think there are some people that want to emulate that because it's something they've always seen their whole entire life to a certain, in a certain extent, they want their match to be a certain way. Maybe they are, you know, Brutus Beefcake fans and they want to, you know, wrestle something like that. Just using an example, I already used the beefer. And uh, I just wanted to say the word beefer. Um, he trademarked that too, by the way, Lars, while we were I'm sitting. sure he did. Yeah, yeah. Beefer and, and Terrifier. Yeah. It's a double DVD set at Walmart. I, I think that uh, sounds like a new wrestler coming to AEW. <laughs> beefer Terrifier is AEW. Wrestling Butcher and Blade on Wednesday. Um, <laughs> Andy will be happy. Um, there are things that stick in my head for trying to make, you know, there's some structural things that I like about building a match. Um, the things that, that were taught to me, you know, I'd be lost if I didn't, you know, I work with a guy named Terry Taylor. All I'm going to say about Terry Taylor, he was always great to me. And Terry was a guy I watched as a kid, and he was a super solid worker. I always thought that. Even when I got to be a smarter fan, I would always watch Terry's work. He was solid. Everything was on point, looked good. And to listen to him, there's lessons I took from him about – he was a big one about having fun. Believe it or not, he was big about having fun. 
And so there would be a drill where a guy would just sell. It doesn't matter how good this, you know, things look. We'll nitpick that in a minute. But let's get to the point where someone sells and you have fun. Excuse me. And shows and shows a person in the ring that it doesn't, it, it, though it's serious business, there's still a point where you can have fun. So, I mean, I could tell you 100% the other night I was in the ring looking like as mean of a motherfucker as I could, beating the shit out of this young dude, clubbing him, slamming him, beating the shit out of him, suplexing him, dunking him with a, a, a trash can. But I was having the time of my life. But I looked like I was ready to destroy him. Always. That, that's the look on my face. Um, you got to believe this is the one big thing. You've got to believe what you're doing. And you hear that in acting. You've heard that for years in wrestling. Um, you know, the bad guy believes what he's doing is right. You have to believe that all the way through. The good guy's got to believe what he's doing is right. You got to believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, that translates to the rest of the world, doesn't it? If you walked out on stage, Lars, and you didn't believe in any of your songs and weren't happy with what you're doing, people just look at you like, well, that song's good, but I can just listen to it at home. This fucker's not doing anything, you know? Uh, that's fair. Just, yeah, I mean, that's where I go with that. Well, you know, one of the things I started thinking about, you know, over the last 10, 12 years here, we've been privy to some pretty groundbreaking, wall-breaking promos. Mm -hmm. by our man CM Punk and then just recently with MJF mm -hmm. and we're seeing things and hearing things out of wrestlers mouths now you know especially coming from the place that you come from in a more old school kind of thing where these types of things never are really touched to that extent do you have an opinion either way I mean I I, I mean as like uh you know your learning curve how you came up um, do you have an opinion either way, whether these types of promos are good or bad, or do you kind of think that that's just the evolution of the business? I think they've always existed. I think they actually got away from them with the, you know, WWF back in the day was all the, the toys and the wrestling buddies and all that stuff. And it was all superficial. It was all superficial on the surface. You didn't know anything about this person as a person. And that worked for a long time. Yes, Rupert, stop. Sorry. You hear him sighing back there. Um, he wants the tacos. That worked. He does want tacos. That's probably what he's looking at. And attention. Um, he, he, wrestling was that. That's why it, it worked for a time. Because it was geared towards the kids. It was the cartoon characters. We didn't care about anyone's lives. The dusty roads and the polka dots, no one cared about, and he wasn't as much of a draw because I didn't care about that dusty roads. Like he was fun to watch and he's entertaining, but he's not the son, he wasn't the son of a plumber anymore. He didn't talk about that guy. He didn't talk about the ground up where he came from. He didn't talk about hard times. Hard times. He didn't talk about loving every woman, you know, any size, any color, you know. He didn't talk about that anymore. They stuck Sapphire with them to try and maybe get that point across or as a, I don't know, you know, whatever the rib is, but you got into the 97 like nitro days and they were more shooty with their wording and more of the advent of the cool heel. But then it kind of died back down and got back to, they could never recapture that glory. I think they went a little bit overboard, um, but everybody was still, we tried to be the larger life guy but we want to talk to you as a real person. Um, I think the promos that touch on real life and say some of the things that are happening in a person's real life are completely fine. I think they've been around forever. I think if you put in NWA, Mid-Atlantic Wrestling and things like that, and watch an old Piper video or watch Don Morocco talk from Georgia, I believe what that, that dude's saying. I believe as a whole, he just talks about the shortcomings of this guy here. Some people would touch on a personal life of someone. Um, I, I think they, they just did it on a grander scale because the promotion in WWE got away from it for so long. And then by the time CM Punk said something and was given the leeway, the green light to, okay, go with your bullet points. And then he took it a step further and that place that like, they couldn't believe what it did. So everyone's trying to use that as a blueprint. Um, 
I think it's completely fine as long as you're not reaching. As long as everybody every week is not trying to cut the pipe bomb as it's been called now. It's been called a pipe bomb and it's famous for a reason because of the one time it was done. You can't cut a pipe bomb every week. You have to have the animosity there. You have to have the frustration. Um, if Sasha Banks walks out next week and everyone knows the story because the internet's so prevalent now and everybody knows everything that's happening, if she walked out on WWE TV next week and cut her version of a pipe bomb, the world would be on the edge of its seat, wouldn't it? Wherever she goes and whatever she does. Um, I just think you just can't use it too much. It's something right. you go to when needed or if it applies. MJF has a problem, apparently, with management and making money. So he's there. And the world knows it. It's, you know, that is the most truthful thing that I could say about all of that is that's the truth. And he spoke about it. Um, he went far and he kept going far. And, you know, haven't seen that guy around in weeks. So I, I don't know. That's, that's uh, not my wheelhouse. But you t- if next week someone else came out and tried to do the same thing, you'd be like, what the fuck is this guy crying about? Like, you know. <laughs> Go eat an ice cream and shut up. Well, that it, that, that's my point. It's like that these types of promos can't be manufactured is no. what I'm saying. It's yeah, not no. something that you can give the guy a script and then go deliver. There has to be a history. There has to be like a, a proper foundation and you have to be emotionally involved. Number, yes. Most importantly to the, to the character or to the wrestler, to the human being. So yes, that's all. Yeah, yes, indeed. My my final question is kind of the piggyback this, and uh, we've seen fads in wrestling come and go. We've seen things from different eras stick around, and uh, I want you to channel your get off my yard old man because <laughs> you came from a generation before this. What are we watching now that will be the backbone of wrestling 10 years from now? I'm biased. Because you can seeing, see it more than we can. We're fans and we watch it now with fan glasses. You're sure. probably watching this going, that's going to stick around for a very long time or all these flippy things will fade away in three years when people want, you know, Matt wrestling as an example. I don't think the flippy things go away. I think it is the evolution of our business. I think the advent of MMA being used in properly um, works in our business. Um, I, so for instance, I'll draw, I'll draw this where people lost their mind. This was the old man on the lawn. Um, Ricochet and it was an Osprey had the new Japan junior tournament. Gosh, it was, it been five, six years now. Yeah. Um, that match they had where it was like a big, it was a lot of backflips, this, that boom, boom. And Spider-Man moment, superhero, like a superhero looked to everything. It was so acrobatic. It was so tight and it was so awesome. And when a meme started going around or uh, all this stuff, people were losing their mind. That's not wrestling. That's not blah, blah, blah. No, that's fucking wrestling. That's talent. And if I could fucking do it, I would have done it. Right. When you watch the new Japan junior heavyweight tournament, that's what I looked for. That's what drew me to Japan. Watching Guerrero and Malenko and one, two, three kid, um, you know, watching Jerry Lynn's style, Jerry Lynn, one, two, three kid on global groundbreaking. Nobody was doing that. Um, bringing some of that in, like that still stays. The reason I watched that stuff, watching Liger back then or watching uh, the great Sasuke, like we scrambled. You couldn't just punch in YouTube to find that shit. I had to order the tape or find it from somewhere, or some tape collector. Um, or you found something from George Mayfield or, you know, whatever he brought back. <laughs> <to Japan. laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but that, that is the evolution watching like Ricochet and Osprey do shit like that. Like, and they're masters at that. Um, I think that's always going to have a place because of the way everything's been ramped up today. I mean, we are a video game society, you know, there's video games in every fucking thing we do. There's video games on your phone now. I mean, whether you're playing something action, it's something with the character. Um, you know, we've spent, you spent time in Japan, Lars. I, I don't know if you have as well, but uh, 
it's it's such a racy like their commercials are racy and eye catching and and it's almost like a strobe light just happening and they just pump all this information at you fast like the characters and things like that which uh, you know they they have their place over there that what draws their attention like that has come over to the states in a lot of ways um, with a lot of things with you know like the Cartoon Network and and things like that. Um, shit, I don't even know what's on the Cartoon Network anymore. It used to be Robot Chicken was kind of groundbreaking. Now I don't know where the hell that is. Like, but I think there's always going to be a place for hard-hitting pro wrestling the proper way. So you've got Brian Danielson showing them the way. You've got CM Punk showing them the way. Showing them how to tell a story, hitting hard in the right places and not killing each other. We don't need broken jaws. We don't need... Uh, people get dropped on their head. Like there's a way to do this without destroying each other. God rest his soul. Um, I said I was a religious guy, but um, rest his soul. Masawa, you know, he died for this business. He died for his company. He knew it was coming. Like he had done so much damage to his body. He lived, breathed, and ultimately died for this business. And he would go back. I don't know if he'd say that I would do it all over again the same way. Or if he would say, I'd like to have a couple more years because now I have kids are getting older and I, you know, I'm getting to be a bit over to, older myself and I like to sit around and drink beer with Tawe. I don't know. Um, but I'm going to guess that he would. And I'm going to guess that he would, you know, draw it back just a little bit. Um, I've taken the head drops, not as many, not as many as a guy like him. Um, I think if it's not policed enough, it will get more dangerous depending on who's doing it. Um, I think the best thing that could have happened for a lot of these young guys is having a Brian Danielson, having a CM Punk, having Samoa Joe back in the mix, having the guys that they watched when they were younger, show them the way to do this because there's no one else to fucking show them how this was done. There's no one else, but Arn Anderson to sit there and talk you through how the story of a match can be done, how Dean Malenko can work, how Jerry Lynn, um, you know, Billy Gunn's been on, how many how many uh wrestlemanias and how many places has he worked you know regal jericho like all these guys are mentoring and helping the next generation of people you know dustin rhodes and his go back to his uh wcw days working uh with steve austin those matches you know um you've got guys like this to draw on hopefully the younger generation is listening to that and i think you're gonna have the evolution is going to be more MMA. I think you're still going to have your commonplace of the, the high flying moves. I just hope that they learn to put them in the right places and not bastardize it all. Mm. Well, honestly, like that's the perfect way. I think we should end this podcast. I don't really want to, you know, I thought that was beautiful. So and this might've been the most educational podcast we've done. I mean, I so. normally we sit back and we ask about people's careers and their lives and this and that, but wow. Uh, you, you took us to school with a, with a very good education today. Well, well, thank you. Uh, and fuck you. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> now go get your fucking shine box. Yeah. Ah. I hope your tacos are cold. Ah, yeah. Well, of course fuck they're fucking you cold. And your ta- fucking tacos. Oh. Man, they're good. They're good brisket tacos. We uh, love your needy. We love your needy dog, though. We where love the where needy do dog. people find you online? Online, Instagram is Aces of Steel. Um, I think that's your Twitter. Twitter. Yeah, Twitter, Aces of Steel, and uh, there is an Ace Steel Facebook out there. I don't do too much with it, um, but I'm always on the. I do post more on the Instagram. I do the. Uh, uh, hold on one second. I'm out of here, please. Sorry. I hope that's the dog, but I think it's a kid. I'm not sure. It's my wife that came home. Oh. And can't get rid of the dog. Go. Even when they're looking at me like I'm like I'm talking. I don't know what she thinks I'm talking to. Yeah, I, there she is. She was trained by Harley Race, but no manners apparently. Oh. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, bitchy uh, Mexican woman. Uh, yeah, I'm getting get hell for that. Yeah, so yeah. you are. All right, yes, listen, guys. Uh, uh, I wanted to give you the story, though, really quick. The Aces of Steel. It's because Sheik Adnan O'Casey. Aces of Steel! He told a guy once, a skinny doink. I'll be going to give it to you. I don't care. He told a skinny doink 
that if you cannot work the aces of steel, I cut my dick off. There you go. <laughs> now that's the perfect way to end the podcast. Thank you. That's this week's wrestling perspective. We'll say our goodbyes off the air for everybody at home. The show is over. Thank you very much. A still. Thanks, guys.